some women respond some ways to some formulations of the pill and other women have absolutely different experiences with it. Our bodies are made to be able to have babies. And, and when you're pregnant, almost every single system in your body has to do something different than what it does normally. And because of this, all of these different systems throughout our body are sensitive to sex hormones. The risk of um, death by suicide is six times higher. Holy crow. This is really important information for women to know because they really need to have somebody who's looking out for them. I never would have even thought about that. I never thought about what was in my tampons. And then it turns out that it's like got formaldehyde in it. We think we can take things, hormones, and be the master of our lives. But there are consequences to, to these that are so far reaching. We have no idea what we're messing with when we decide to take our biology into our own hands. Whew. Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm talking to Dr. Sarah Hill. Dr. Sarah Hill earned her PhD from the University of Texas. She is currently a researcher and professor of psychology at TCU. Her research on women, health, and sexual psychology has been published in more than 75 articles. That's a lot of articles. She is regularly featured in news outlets like the New York Times, The Economist, the Washington Post, and many others. Most recently, Sarah has authored This Is Your Brain on Birth Control, a groundbreaking book about the effects of hormonal contraceptives on women's psychology. I was overly excited to talk to Dr. Hill. I think that this is a really important issue uh, for women, but also for men to just understand what's going on with the birth control pill and being careful with it. It's a hormone, being really careful with it. So I, I hope everybody enjoys this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Or I should say Dr. Hill. Yeah, you, can call me, you can call me Sarah. I can call you Sarah. I had a professor when I was in kinesiology. I don't know what I called him. Mr. Maybe? And he said, that's doctor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, that's an old memory from like 30 years ago. But, you know, those kind of things stick with you. It's amazing, hey, the things you remember. When it's a difference in seniority and someone of senior, like, does something that is pushing down on your head. Yeah, like chastises you in some way. It's almost like, um, you know, the original, uh, the, um, the obedience studies where they have the person telling the, the people that they need to continue with the experiment, um, mm. even though they're harming people. But, but it, you know, there's a lot of research in social psychology, like showing the, that normative pressure from, uh, superiors, um, you know, causes like really high levels of conformity. But I also think that, um, when you have that power asymmetry that it creates, yeah, these these memories that just get seared into our brain. That would be a good conversation for these days too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? So I really enjoyed reading your book. And I tell you, uh, now you have to tell me the exact name because I might say it wrong. The brain, uh, our brain this, on birth control. Is that right? This is this is your brain on birth control. This is your brain on birth control. And my brain was totally like stymied by the pill. And so I've been waiting, I would say, 45 years, because that's how long ago it was that I started taking the pill when I was 15. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it radically changed what I was like. So I'm really interested in talking about this. So why don't you just give my guests... Uh, a little lowdown on who you are and why you wrote the book. Sure. So, uh, so I'm Dr. Sarah Hill, and I um, uh, am a research psychologist and professor um, at TCU in Fort Worth, and um, I've spent most of my career studying uh, women and health and and sexual psychology, and. Um, yeah, I really didn't have any special interest in hormonal birth control or, or the pill, which we'll just call it from here on out to make things short and sweet and easy to say. Um, I didn't really think that much about it until, um, until I went off of it. 
I, I was on it like a lot of women are um, throughout most of my 20s. Um, I was on it, I, I went on it probably about seven, or around age 17, 18. I was on it for about 11 years. Um, I went off it briefly for periods of time to have my two children. Um, but that didn't take very long in either case. Uh, so I, I didn't have like a, a long span of time without it. And then of course, when I was, um, when I was lactating, I, I wasn't on it, but you know, that's like a totally different hormonal state as well. Um, but it was about when, when my youngest child was, was two years old, um, I, I discontinued hormonal birth control and within, I don't know, it was about three or so months after I discontinued it, I started sort of looking back at my behavior over the last couple of months and was really sort of noticing that, um, that things had gotten a little bit different for me. Um, and that, and that I'd felt like I'd woken up in a lot of ways. Um, I'd noticed that I had started, um, exercising again and started downloading new music on my, um, on my phone. I downloaded Pandora, which of course is an app that plays, you know, new music. And, um, and so I, I'd done the, and I started cooking again. I was more interested in sex in a way that I really hadn't been, um, in, in a long time. Um, I just, I just, felt like I had been sort of in this grayscale world. And then all of a sudden I was like climbing into reality and I was just feeling things more deeply and enjoying things more. And, um, and I started to wonder like, is it possible that these changes are the result of uh, discontinuing hormonal birth control? Um, and so um, I went and I started looking around at the research literature to see what you know, people have been publishing on uh, the effects of hormonal birth control on women's brains and how women think, feel, and experience the world. And I was completely shocked to learn um, that researchers had been publishing on this for years and, um, and that I just didn't know any of it. And uh, I, it was really shocking to me as both a psychologist um, and, and, and a really act, you know, an active researcher, um, somebody who's pretty, I've got my finger on the pulse of what's going on in terms of um, women's sexuality and, and, and hormonal changes and the way that mm -hmm. hormonal changes affect women. Um, and as somebody who was on hormonal birth control for as long as I was, I was, it was really surprising to me that I didn't have access to any of this information. And so um, mm -hmm. I decided to write the book uh, and do the research that was required for the book to put the information out there for women. Um, since, you know, if, if I didn't know about it as a researcher who's in this area, like I thought, what are the chances anybody else does? Why do you think you didn't know? Oh gosh, you know, th this is a really complicated uh, answer to that question. And I think that a, one of the big pieces of it um, is because of the siloed nature of, uh, of medicine, you know, it's like in, in science, um, because, you know, in, in the field of medicine, which of course, you know, as, as originally practiced, you know, originated at a time before, uh, people understood that the brain was a body part and, you know, cause people used to endorse that idea of like the mind body split, right. Where like the soul is like where all of your thoughts and feelings and, mm -hmm. and all of that comes from and that your body is, is just, you know, the nuts and bolts that make your heart go and your lungs function. Um, and, and, and in some ways, medicine has never recovered from that split because when you look at drugs, for example, when, when, um, when researchers are looking at whether or not drugs are something that should be used with a patient population, they look at safety, right? So is it going to kill you or not? And then efficacy, does it work? Um, but they don't ever really look at the experiential pieces of it because um, I don't, you know, when people started doing medical research, they didn't really understand that when you change what the body's doing, that also changes what the brain does um, a lot of the time. And, and so th that's an important piece of it. Um, and so like the people from the medical literature are, are in like the medical field, um, they are absolutely um, disconnected from anything that's happening in neuroscience or, you know, um, neuroendocrinology, all of the, all of the, that research. And so I think like one piece of it is just simply the fact that there's no crosstalk between medical research and, uh, and what's going on in psychology and neuroscience. So I think that's, that's one component of it. And mm -hmm. then I also think another component of it is because the research is relatively new. Um, it's something that, that doctors tend to be super duper 
cautious about like, well, you know, we may have found in several research studies now that use a cross-sectional approach that is looking at the differences between women who are users of hormonal birth control and women who are not, and then looking at outcomes. Um, you know, there might have been several studies published showing an association between use and, and risk of depression, but because there are, are v- relatively few smoking gun, you know, um, uh, experimentally designed studies because of the complexities of studying the birth control pill experimentally. Um, I think that doctors tend to be a little bit overly cautious in terms of their willingness to even discuss the possibility of um, any types of psychological side effects because we, there's not as much smoking gun research. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and I think that we need to be careful with that. You know, certainly anybody who's talking about um, the effects of the pill and how it might influence women psychologically. I think it's really important to say, like, we don't know for certain that there's a cause and effect relationship for between these variables. Oops, sorry about that. And That's because okay. of the heterogeneity in um, women's responses to different formulations of the pill, you know, we don't know for certain that you're going to experience any one of these effects. But um, for whatever reason, they feel uncomfortable having conversations about things that can happen. And that's, and that's where my book comes in. You know, I, I think that the, um, the important uh, message that's being communicated in my book isn't like, here's what's going to happen to you if you're on the pill um, and don't go on the pill. Right. Instead, mm-hmm. it's like, here's what we know from research. Here's some of the things that researchers have found. And, and you know, um, theoretically, you know, here's what we should expect might happen given the way that hormones work. And because we know a lot about the way that hormones affect the brain and the way that hormones affect behavior. And so we can also sort of like understanding that, you know, sort of uh, look at things that um, should or systems that are likely to get affected Mm. by hormonal birth control pill use because you're changing hormones. And so, you know, we can kind of present to women this information about, you know, what are the range of effects that are possible? So that way women are able to um, think about that and then make decisions, you know, for themselves. And also if they choose to go on it, they're able to know what to look for. Because I think that like, so in, in, in it sounds like you had this experience as well, um, mm-hmm. but so many women will go on uh, the pill and, you know, they don't really know exactly what to expect or what's even possible. And then they'll experience things like, for example, anxiety or, or depression or reduced libido. And, um, and they, they don't even think about the fact that it's their pill. You know, they think that there's something wrong with them or they think yeah. that all of a sudden they're depressed. Um, and, and so this book is just about really providing this information to women. So that way, if they do experience these effects, they have a, a, a starting place. You know, mm-hmm. they, 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 they kind of have a, a frame of reference for, for um, what to do next. What are the difficulties that you find in doing the research for women on hormonal birth control? Well, I mean, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, being able to determine cause and effect between, um, you know, does using uh, hormonal or does using the pill, which really, again, we'll just use that as shorthand, does yeah, using the pill, um, you know, cause this type of outcome and that type of outcome, it's very difficult um, to do research that establishes that just simply because randomly assigning people to use the pill or a placebo is is tricky, right? Because um, if somebody thinks that for they- For ethical are, reasons? For ethical yeah, reasons? For, yeah, yeah, for ethical reasons. Uh, um, given, given, you know, like if, if you think that you're on the pill and you have, the, you have a placebo, Um, then that is sort of minimizing your reproductive autonomy. Same thing the other way. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If if you think that you're on a placebo and then um, you're given the pill. (laughs) You end up with a baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so so there's difficulties that way because it is, um, you know, potentially uh, affecting a woman's reproductive autonomy when you do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're kind of... So double blind, like double blind studies are impossible yeah. really yeah uh, i mean re- really very very challenging and um and uh in in, in and so that that makes things really hard and then the, another so that's like one category of of um issues with it mm-hmm. another thing that makes it really tricky is 
Um, there are, you know, when we look at the different formulations of um, hormones that are in the different types of, of pills that are out there um, and the different types of progestins, which is the synthetic progesterone that is used to suppress um, the activities of women's um, brain ovarian axis, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in what's being used. What's heterogeneity? I can't remember. Oh, okay, yeah, that that's is. a great pro Yeah, gosh, I'm like using science speak. There's a lot of differences. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of differences in like, um, in the, the formulations of what's out mm -hmm. there in terms of the medication mm -hmm. and, um, and that amount of variability. And then also there's a lot of variability in how women respond to even mm -hmm. the exact same medication. Right. It makes it really right. hard to like, know. well, what, does this cause this effect or does it not? Because when you look at the, the literature, you know, it seems very clear that some women respond some ways to some formulations of the pill and other women have absolutely different experiences with it. Um, and, and, and the reasons, you know, for this are, are our bodies are incredibly complex and our, and, you know, each one of us comes into um, a, a prescription for the pill with, uh, you know, a different level of hormones, right? So like me and my next door neighbor, even for the same age and, you know, everything else, like she and I probably have different hormone levels. And so if mm -hmm. she and I were to take the same pill and it does, you know, and it does this to us for somebody who's starting levels of hormone were here okay. and to somebody who's starting levels of hormone are here, it's going to have very different effects because for this person, it's going to feel really different and weird, right? And they're probably going to have a whole range of side effects because their body's not used to that. Whereas somebody whose levels of hormones are normally kind of here, it might not be that big of a deal. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it, and, and we don't know that. And we don't know how many hormone receptors, we don't know like the density of a person's hormone receptors. We don't know the way that their bodies metabolize hormones. And because hormones affect so many different bodily systems, it's like also hard to predict, like, you know, somebody might have a really sensitive liver to uh, to hormonal signaling and somebody else might have a really sensitive um, hypothalamus. It's just, you know, th there's mm. so many areas for messiness that it means that the way that people respond is just really different from one another. So when you're um, doing this kind of research and you're looking at different systems in the body, different organs that might, would respond, what are the, what are those broadly speaking? How many are there and where are they in the body? They're all of them everywhere. All of them everywhere. <laughs> well, that's a good, that's right. Well, I mean, here, here's the deal. Um, you know, so in, in, in one way to think about this, you know, is, um, is, you know, women, our bodies are made, um, for better and for worse, um, to be able to have babies. Yes. And, and, uh, and because of that, um, our different, and, and, and when you're pregnant, almost every single system in your body has to do something different than what it does normally. Your mm -hmm. circulatory system has to do something different. Your brain has to do something different. Your um, metabolism has to do something different, right? So your immune system has to do something different. And because of this, all of these different systems throughout our body are sensitive to sex hormones because mm -hmm. sex hormones essentially give them different instructions about what to do, depending on what the levels of hormone are. And so, you know, there's not a system in the body that I can think of, um, not one that isn't sensitive to sex hormones because right. it, 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 they have to be. It's like we're, we're made to have a really respond, a body that's very sensitive to sex hormones. And, um, and so when you take something like the pill, I mean, you can't, um, the way that sex hormones work and the way that all hormones work in the body um, is rather than having a, a sort of a, di a direct communication signal between like, let's say, for example, you know, your brain to your spinal cord, there's like, you know, there's like a one pathway, right? And it's, it's connected through, you know, neural fibers and, and neurons and so on. And, um, and so a message just goes from point A to point B. Um, and that's how neurotransmission works. But with hormones, hormones get released in the body in a diffuse manner. And what this means is that, you know, typically if you're body, like you have an endocrine organ, like for example, say the ovaries, they'll release a hormone and the hormone gets into the bloodstream 
And then it travels every single place in the body that blood travels. And then it only gets picked up by cells in the body that have a receptor for that hormone. Mm. So, so any, you know, if you like put hormones in the body, it goes everywhere that blood travels. Mm -hmm. And, and then it just gets picked up by systems that are able to receive the signal. But the thing is, because we're women and we have these bodies that have to reprogram themselves um, in response to pregnancy, and even, you know, with the ovulatory cycle, um, our systems everywhere have receptors for these hormones. I see. <laughs> oh, yeah. So men, men's wouldn't, hey? Men's wouldn't have the same... Yeah, I don't think so. No, well, maybe we don't know that yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know that yet. But my, you know, my guess is that there are probably fewer receptors for testosterone receptors throughout men's bodies mm. than there are in women's bodies for estrogen and progesterone, just uh, simply because of the pregnancy issue. Right. Right. And and they're beginning to see that um, women's sex hormones are, are, you know, do seem to be playing a role in a whole bunch of things that we you wouldn't necessarily think sex hormones would be involved in, like the development of autoimmunity, for example. Um, and it's because of sex hormones and the way that they modulate the immune system. Oh, that's um, interesting. You know, I have many autoimmune troubles and I had totally. and I took the birth control pill from on and off because it was screwing with me. So it was on and off between 15 and 30, you know, just, and I'll tell you just briefly, uh, when I went on the pill when I was 15, my mother knew there was something wrong, but I didn't tell her I was on the pill and the doctor didn't go, I didn't need my mother's okay right. to take the pill. So I just got the pill. I was the youngest of four in the family. Everybody else was gone to university. I was the last kid at home and did my own thing really largely. And so I went on the pill and right away my mood changed right away. And in fact, I married uh, my husband. I, I've known him since he was, when we were eight years old. So we grew up together and we were friends. We went to school together. And actually I told him that I'd read your book and I, and then I, you know, was reminiscing about, when I was 17, kind of, he said, you know what? He said, when you were about 17, he, like, he doesn't remember when, I was going to ask you, what was going on? Because something changed. So, so he knew something changed. My mother knew something changed. I kind of couldn't tell something changed, you know, you, right? Yeah. Because my mood had changed, but I couldn't, I mean, that's no, my just, mood. Like, that's my mood. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's so interesting how we ad adopt and in, in we can't see changes in ourselves because our brain yeah. tells ourselves a story about this is just how things have always been. I, this is just how things are. And you think so that how would, So how would you suggest people, women, when they start the birth control pill, how should they monitor themselves? I think that's a really great question. And I think that the like, two really um, important ways to do that are one, um, I think if you can, if you're able to um, keep a journal before you go on it, and then after you start, and I like to do a process of, I call it objective journaling. And I'm a scientist. And so of course, I love this. Um, but essentially, you know, you, and, and I, and I give some instructions about this in my book, but you can kind of categorize the important domains in your life that are, you know, like my, my sexual desire is here. My energy levels are here. My mood is here. My anger levels are here. My, my anxiety is here and just rate it on a one to seven scale every day for a little while. Mm -hmm. And you can like accumulate your data over and say like, all right, on average, before I started using this, my anger levels were at five and my, you know, this was at this. Um, and then look and see what happens after you start hormonal birth control and do the same thing. And then you can sort of tally your responses and look and see whether the averages that you're sort of experiencing when you're not on it are the same as when you're on it. And so that's one method. And then the other is like simply talking to your friends and your partners and your relatives, you know, have somebody who's looking after you and let them know what you're doing. And sometimes, you know, for, especially for young girls that mm -hmm. might not be apparent. Um, if their, their parent doesn't know, like yours didn't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, in, in just telling them like, I'm going to do this thing and, um, and it might have mood effects and I need you to tell me whether or not I seem like I'm getting different. 
So and, why would it be mood effects that you would be um, bringing up? Mood effects to me, um, especially when we're talking about young people, um, I mean, th these are some of the most serious um, and, and the most consequential and can have really devastating um, outcomes. So there's been some research, um, you know, while well, there's there's been a, a lot of research now linking um, uh, hormonal birth control use to um, to the risk of anxiety and depression. And this risk is asymmetrically shouldered um, by young women. How so, young? Um, how young 19, women? 19 and younger. 19 and younger. Yeah. Right. And in, in many, and in some cases, the risk of developing like depression and anxiety for these populations is sometimes like three times higher than what it is for an adult. I mean, it's, 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 that's much, a lot. It's, that's it's a much lot. What, what other kind of uh, things happen to us that are, that have that kind of effect, that big three times is higher. Is there anything else that you can name that has that um, kind of, to show people just how big of an effect that is? Right. Um, oh gosh, you know, uh, I, I wish I had a good one off the top of my head, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially kind of like the, the risk of developing lung cancer from smoking, you know I mean? It's, it's like something see, where, right, where right. like, mm -hmm. you that's know, a good where, one. <laughs> yeah. Where it, and, and so it's, it's like, a, it's a big, you know, when you look at the, the differences between being a, 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 a adult woman who starts the pill versus a, an adolescent woman who starts the pill, there's some big differences. And they've looked hmm. at um, the risk of, of the suicide risk of, of women if, if they start a prescription of hormonal birth control or not. And that also, um, they find that there's an increased risk. And, uh, and again, particularly for adolescent women, these women who are 19 and younger, um, and particularly within the first three months of use, so for um, whatever reason, the risk factor um, is uh, it decreases after women have been on it for a period of time. And it's probably the survivorship bias, right? Where women who are having the most negative, like strong negative reactions um, are probably going off of it, you right. know, after three months. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and so th there's that ac accounting for that. But in that case, the, the risk of um, death by suicide is six times higher. Um, than what it is for the regular, for the non, uh, yeah. hormonal contraceptive. I believe I mean, that. It, yeah. It's really, um, and, and, and so th this is really important information for, um, for women to know, especially if they're young women going on it because they really need to have somebody who's looking out for them Absolutely. and, and letting them know. And, and, and like you said, and I, I think it's so, um, I think it's such an important point and that is that um, when we are going through some sort of an anxiety or depression, we don't think to ourselves, our brain doesn't see it that way. No. We just think that our life is terrible or like mm -hmm. things don't feel right, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. we blame it on these. We don't understand that there's something going on. Our, our brain just makes sense of it. And it just seems like who we are. Right. Um, and, and so you're, I really appreciate you sharing your experience like that because I think that that's very common. When well, I tell are, you, I went on and off the pill through my, and after my second baby was born and we decided we weren't going to have any babies soon. So I thought I'd go on the pill again and I got terribly depressed right away and went off of it again. So that, that mood changing, it, it held with me. It didn't go away once I was older, but maybe, and maybe you can tell me this from your book, all the damage was done when I was young to my brain. And then maybe that's why I still exhibited depressive episodes later? Yeah, no, I think that that's entirely possible. So there's been, um, you know, just if, if, before I tell you about the research results, just this little uh -huh. bit of background about brain development, you know, the, the brain isn't done developing un until we're in our 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and especially there's a whole lot of things happening um, in terms of brain development um, between the time of puberty um, and then, you know, between, between then and the time that somebody's about 20, I mean, it, that's a period mm -hmm. of really rapid, um, a brain, I always call it remodeling because essentially that's what's going on. It's like your brain is remodeling itself. Pruning from, too, uh, pruning, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, pruning and it's that. also growing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and essentially it's, it's taking, it's, tr it's transitioning itself from it's like child version of itself to the grown up version of itself. 
Right. And um, and this process is coordinated by our sex hormones, which are surging during the pubertal transition. Mm -hmm. And so when you put a woman on hormonal birth control during this period where the brain is still developing and, and you know going through this period of rapid change that's influenced so heavily by the sex hormones, um, it makes absolutely, you know, it, it would it makes absolute sense that taking hormonal birth control might affect this process. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, it, in my mind, it would be impossible for pill use during adolescence not to affect brain development. Because I can't right. imagine a miracle, right, by which all of a sudden these hormones aren't affecting brain development when that's what hormones do during that period. So what kind of changes would, it, would uh, what kind of changes would there be? For later, for when you're grown and you've been taking the pill from 15 to 19. Right. That's the $8 million question that nobody has an answer to. Oh, nobody because, has an answer to that. No. Well, so I'll tell, you, <laughs> I'll tell you what we know and then I'll tell you what we don't know. Okay. Um, so what we do know is that now there's been a couple of studies out that have found that um, hormonal birth control use during adolescence, mm -hmm. so again, during that period, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is associated with a heightened risk of developing major depressive disorder throughout the lifetime. Right. There, so, there you go. There you go. Which, which is consistent with your experiences, right, where your brain seems to have been sensitized to po the possible development of depression. Mm -hmm. And then when you started um, birth control again as an adult, your brain was like, oh, nope. And, and you sort of went into that. It was, you were able to like quickly tilt into a depressive state. And, and, and would that have happened to you if you weren't an adolescent user? We don't know. We don't know. Um, yeah. Research suggests that, that it's possible that you would not. Right. So we know that. What we don't know is, is everything else, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, there has mm -hmm. been, and this is both shocking and not shocking when we think about the state of, um, you know, women's health and, and adolescent health, honestly, um, there is almost no research about the effects of uh, hormonal birth control use during adolescence on any adult outcome for women at all. This shocked me when I read that in your book. That was the one thing that I came away with that I was like, oh, my God, what have we done? We've put people on these pills. We don't have any research to back it up. Oh, my goodness. No, I know, you know, and I think about this, gosh, you know, I think about this all the time because there's this, you know, there's a big push in healthcare right now um, about trying to in increase the um, inclusiveness of research to include more women and women's issues. And I mm -hmm. think that this is incredibly important. Um, and, you know, for so long, women haven't been studied and not, why, you know, not? Didn't, why not? They didn't why know not? They don't know anything about us. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And in part, it, it started just because, um, because every, you know, people didn't think that women were worth studying. It was like, you know, they, um, there was like blatant sexism going on. Um, but then after that, you know, after we sort of like progressed a little bit as a society and we decided that w women actually matter as citizens, um, there was still the assumption that we could use any research that's conducted on men and we could use it and apply it to women yeah. right? with this idea yeah. that men and women are just absolutely interchangeable. And, um, and there was that, a time, and, there was a time, right? There was a time yeah. that we thought that way. And, you know, look, kids are like that. Kids are very similar, right? Aren't they when they're before puberty? Yeah. Before puberty, they're, they're pretty similar to each other. Right. So we they're just didn't take that up and see the changes that happen at, at, right. uh, adolescence. Yeah. I mean, the, um, sex matters, you know, and it's funny because we're getting into this cultural space where, um, yes. everybody's kind of moving away from this idea of sex and it's like, no, like, <laughs> look, we can, we can like all of this stuff, you know, with, um, with gender and everything is like, it's great. And like, that matters. Biological sex matters too. And, and, and if we don't like address it, um, it's actually really dangerous for women in particular, because then we go back into this world where we um, assume that that research that's conducted on men is going to apply to us. And it doesn't mm -hmm. um, because our sex hormones change. And, and, you know, and a lot of the research that's out there that has looked at, you know, almost everything that we know about health and heart attack risk and aging and all of these things, a lot of that research was done only on men just because their hormones don't change cyclically like ours do. And because we have cyclically changing sex hormones, it makes us more challenging to study. 
Yeah, and more expensive something. because you have to find women at that time of the month, all of them the same. Yeah. That's tricky. I imagine that's very tricky. It is tricky. And I mean, maybe don't, women don't want to share that information either or yeah, they don't yeah. want to be put under a microscope like that because you'd have to be put under a microscope. You'd have to track your ovulation and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. no, it's, it, 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 it is. It's a challenge. And, um, and if we pretend like males and females are exactly the same, mm -hmm. then we end up with taking this research that's done on men and trying to apply it to us and, and our issues in our health. And, um, and as is increasingly becoming understood, that just doesn't work. You know, it's right. like men and women, it's like heart attack symptoms are very different. Our risks of autoimmunity are very different. The types of mental health problems that we get are very different. And, and, and a lot of those variables, a lot of those differences are things that stem from, from biological differences that we have between us and, and men. And we need to, you know, be able to get a better finger on the pulse of, of women. Yeah, that's a huge like, that's a huge problem. But but you yeah. said that that we are beginning to Yeah. How long yeah, how long has that research been going on that they've been using women in their own re in their studies? Oh gosh. You know, it's probably been um it's probably been uh, at least the, the last two decades have been um a lot more uh inclusive of women in no research um, because the NIH has required it, but here's what they've required. Okay. They've required that you use women in research. Yeah, um, but the way that that looks a lot of the times is if you have a study where you're collecting data on let's say 100 participants, 80 of those will be male, right? And then 20 oh, will yeah. be female. You never actually treat sex as a biological variable that might impact the result, mm -hmm. and um, and that's not actually telling us anything. You know, we need um, all research that's being done on biomedical processes, in my opinion, needs to be done with sample sizes, equal sample sizes of men and women in large enough sizes where we're able to um, detect differences between the sexes if they exist. So that way right. we know right. whether or not something is working the same way in women and men, because we just, the way that the, the, um, the requirements are right now, that isn't the case. And mm -hmm. to circle back to the issue with um, adolescent uh, birth control use, um, you know, there's, I think that one of the next big pushes that we need to see in terms of, um, really pushing for, um, research equity is, um, is looking at adolescents. I mean, so many parents and I'm not one of them, but there are very many parents who are putting their adolescents on, on prescription medications, yeah. um, whether it's right. hormonal birth control or different types of psychotropic medications like yes. antidepressants Essent or depressants, yeah. mm -hmm. and we know nothing about those effects on, on brain development. And here we are, these, you know, people are growing into their adult version of themselves and we don't know what we're doing to them and who we're making them yes. in response to the drugs that we're giving them. Oh yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that that's criminal, honestly. Um, and, mm -hmm. and certainly, you know, with the pill and, and, and also with, um, with these different types of uh, psychological medications that we're giving women or, or men and women, it, it, young men and women, it, it um, concerns me. Yes. That's very concerning. That's very concerning. When did your book come out? So my book came out in uh, in 2019, in October 2019, right before the oh. pandemic. Oh, yeah, right. So how has it gone then in uh, sales? How have sales gone? And, you know, how has it, it, has it been distributed widely? And yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, it's been, um, it's been published in, um, I think that it's like six different languages now. Um, so we've oh, got good. publishers all over the place. Oh, that's all exciting. Yeah, no, it is. I think that is it's, there um, follow up research that's been because of this. Yeah, yeah. So we've been um, we've been g conducting research in uh, in my lab, looking at some of these issues, and in particular, you know, speaking of your autoimmunity um, mm. sort of note from earlier, we've been doing some research looking at um, different uh, inflammatory. Like, th does a hormonal birth control use, given that hormones play a role in modulating the immune system? Yeah. Right. Um, is it, are there differences in inflammatory activity that women experience in response to stress as a result, as a result of pill use? And so we've mm -hmm. been doing some mm -hmm. research looking at that to look at the different inflammatory profiles um, of women who are users and non-users when, when we stress them out in the research lab. And so we've been doing some stuff with that. Um, and Very certainly 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I think mm -hmm. that, um, I think that we're going to learn because um, we've already got evidence from a first study showing that there seem to be different um, inflammatory profiles. Mm -hmm. So just essentially that the, that the way that um, you know the immune system is dealing with stress, um, which is something that that awakens the immune response. Um, that that it does differ between users and non-users of um, of, of uh, the birth control pill, and so we're doing some follow-ups on this and in looking at whether it might um, contribute to uh, differences that we see in mood, um, yeah. because uh, inflammation, in addition to um, in addition to influencing a person's uh, risk of autoimmunity, is also something that um, can impact uh, their their mood. Absolutely, so really, yeah. yeah. Well. So really I don't know. Do you know that? So my family, my husband, myself, and my daughter, we all only eat meat mm -hmm. because we've got so much autoimmune troubles and the, and meat isn't inflammatory. So we've had to get rid of anything inflammatory in our bodies in order to control our autoimmune disease. And wow. thinking that the birth control pill may have been at the bottom of this, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, it could potentially have contributed to that. I mean, yeah. th there's a growing <laughs> amount of, of research that seems to suggest that, um, well, there, we've known for a really long time that sex hormones are involved in the development of autoimmunity. And, um, and more recently, um, there's been evidence accumulating that suggests that um, birth control use may um, have have an impact on on the long term risks of developing these things as well. So, what about if you're on the birth control pill, and you have and you get pregnant and have a baby? Do any of the things that does any of the right, hormones that right. I've been taking pass on? Does any of that information get passed on to the baby? Do we know any so of that? No, no, and that's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't think that that's something that. Um, that is a concern um, because I mean, presumably, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Presumably, you know, if you get pregnant, um, you discontinue it. Yes. You know, you right. discontinue. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know whether there's any sort of like epigenetic modification that goes on as a result of mom's previous birth control use that then impacts um, sort of the a child, mm -hmm. but I don't know for certain, I don't know one way or the other, you know, mm. but it's certainly possible. Hmm. I wanted I to ask another question. Mate choice. Mate yes. choice on the pill and off the pill. Let's just talk about that. Yeah, sure. So um, there's been research now for uh, several decades that finds that um, women's sex hormones uh, play a role in, uh, in who women are attracted to. Yeah. Um, and in particular, what this research has found is that when levels of estrogen are high across the cycle, and um, estrogen is uh, the sex hormone that gets released in high quantities when women are getting ready to ovulate or release an egg every month. So when an egg is developing, it releases the, these high levels of estrogen. Um, and this coincides with the fertility window across the cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the period of time during the cycle when women can get pregnant from sex. Mm -hmm. And so this generally occurs um, usually starting around, you know, five to seven days prior to ovulation. And for most mm -hmm. women, most women, if you are looking at a cycle, um, ovulate around day 14 of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, you know, we're looking at any, like anything from like day seven onward, women are starting to release relatively high levels of estrogen. And there's been uh, research showing that at this time in the cycle, when estrogen is being released in high quantities, that this is associated with an increased preference for markers um, of uh, genetic quality um, in partners. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's been research showing that um, women, when estrogen is high across the cycle, um, exhibit a heightened preference for men who have different immune genes than their own. Um, mm -hmm. And this is something that is a reason to occur because um, having uh, children with diverse immune genes is something that is um, mm -hmm. very advantageous um, in terms of uh, child's health. There's been a lot of research showing 
that women exhibit a preference for uh, cues to facial and vocal masculinity mm -hmm. um, when uh, women are at uh, high fertility across the cycle. So what's um, the so difference? What's the difference between a woman's choice during ovulation of a man uh -huh. and and when she's not ovulating? You, you, yeah, naturally, so with no birth control pill. Yeah, with no birth control, what you generally see is that there's this increase in women's preference for um, things related to like masculinity and that sort of thing that sort of decreases at points in the cycle that are that are not fertile. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what all of this is telling us is that estrogen um, is predicting an increased preference for especially um, things like facial and vocal and behavioral masculinity. And so masculinity would be jaw width, right? What's another thing besides jaw width? Yeah. So jaw width, and uh, there's a ratio of jaw width to facial height. I'm um, mm -hmm. having deep set eyes, having a, a deeper brow ridge. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And, and those are some of the like facial cues. Mm -hmm. And then um, in terms of uh, vocal cues, like depth oh, yeah. of voice is something mm -hmm. that's related to testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. um, behavioral uh, cues to testosterone are being somebody who's socially dominant mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and sort of competitive. And, so more disagreeable uh, people, possibly, <laughs> right? Possibly. You possibly, know, more people yeah. who are more cut and dried in their well, yeah, presentation. Just, yeah. Yeah. Decisive. Right. Right. Decisiveness right. Um, is related to testosterone levels. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, uh, all, you know, so we know from research on naturally cycling women, they get this waxing and waning in the cycle where when estrogen levels increase, you see an increase for testosterone and, um, and all of its various markers. And then when you're at a point in the cycle when estrogen drops, that, that, preference decreases. And so it's been more recently that researchers said, well, wait a minute. So what happens when you give women hormonal birth control? Mm -hmm. Because when you take the pill, it keeps estrogen levels really low and you don't get any, you know, intercycle variability in terms of your preference for uh, masculinity. Mm -hmm. And so this led the researchers to predict that, um, women who are using hormonal birth control should exhibit less of a preference for cues to uh, masculinity uh, and, and testosterone relative to naturally cycling women. Hmm. And they've done several studies now. I shouldn't say several studies. That's, that's disingenuous. I, that's an, that's a, it was an unintentional exaggeration. They've been, they've done, they've done a few studies now. They've done a handful of studies. This is new. This is relatively new area of okay. research. Okay. Looking at um, women's preference for uh, facial masculinity in particular um, and its relationship to hormonal birth control use. And what the research finds is that women who are on the pill exhibit less of a preference for masculine male faces than what's exhibited by naturally cycling women. And um, they've also looked at like who women are actually choosing as their partners. Mm -hmm. So in one study, for example, they had, um, they had uh, romantic couples um, uh, come into a research laboratory. They um, asked uh, whether, you know, they, they took uh, photographs of the faces of um, of the men, mm -hmm. and they asked the women about whether they met their partner when they were on or off of hormonal birth control. Mm -hmm. And then they took men's pictures and they put them in two piles. Right, one pile was the the faces of men who were chosen by partners who were on the pill, and the other pile was chosen by uh, women who were not. And then they had an external group of evaluators evaluate and rate the facial masculinity of each pile of faces. They didn't know. You know, nobody knew what who what the hypothesis was that was being tested, and they also looked at objective measures. Again, looking at that um, facial width to height ratio, which mm -hmm. is something that's related to testosterone levels. And what they found was that the faces of the men who were chosen by women as partners when they were on the pill that they had fewer. Um, they were evaluated as being less masculine, like they they were perceived as being having less facial masculinity. And um, the ratios indicated that they exhibited less facial masculinity. And this is just consistent, again, with what you would expect, given that hormonal birth control keeps um, estrogen levels really low. And, and, you know, we would expect that the naturally cycling women, some of them would be really dialed in to testosterone markers and they're choosing their partners and kind of going that route. Mm -hmm. And that women who are using hormonal birth control are going a different route. 
So what 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 percentage of women are on birth control pill like that are ovulating ovulating women childbearing age like that kind of yeah it it varies um, we don't varies. have those do we have those statistics yeah you know th- we do have those statistics somewhere I believe that it's somewhere like twenty percent twenty percent it varies hugely depending on the age range that you're talking about and what about societies different that must be different in different societies right. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, um, a place like the U.S. and in Western Europe, yeah, um, there are a lot of women who are, and, and probably Canada too, is my guess. Yeah. Um, Canada always falls off the map. You know, people pretend that Canada doesn't exist, which I'm sure makes you guys feel great. Um, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're they just like assume is like part of the U.S. You know, um, but or they lump us together. So, U.S. and Canada are probably lumped together in that in those data, mm, maybe. Um, and uh, but you know North America mm-hmm. and uh, in Western Europe are are the big users, um, and then other places in the world are it's it's like a lot less frequent. Like Latin America, for example, it's it's used a lot less uh, frequently. Even in the Mediterranean countries in Europe, it's mm-hmm. a little bit it's like less frequently used. And I think a lot of that has to do with the. Um, the uh, uh, influence of the Catholic Church mm-hmm. and their history, and, and even though the Catholic Church is now on board with um, at least some sort of flavors of the Catholic Church, are on board with uh, the pill use, others are not, mm-hmm. um, and and the historical sort of um, prohibiting of the pill mm-hmm. um, is something that um, I think the legacy of that sort of carries over culturally in Mediterranean and Latin American countries. Mm-hmm. And so you see less frequent use there. Um, and you also see, it's really interesting because um, for the first time ever um, since its introduction, we've begun to see um, use of the pill begin to decline. And, oh, really? Um, just- Mm. Yeah. And so it's like decreased like 11% or something. Oh, that's in the last quite high. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, uh, this I mm. think is also a generational thing that we're seeing going on here mm. um, because uh, the younger women like Gen Z um, and uh, in Gen Z prime, right. Our millennial women, um, they are a lot more wary of the idea of putting things into their bodies that they don't understand um, than my generation was. And oh, it sounds like, good. Even like, like oh, my generation was. was totally, we just did whatever we were given kind of thing. Yeah, you know? no, so it's, it's same. Like I, yeah. same, I didn't, I never, th- I never thought to question what was going in my body. Oh, and now, no, no. you know, these latest generations of women are like, I need to know what's in my tampons. Like, I'm not putting that up. You have to list mm. like what is going on with the cotton. Cause that's not going to touch me until I know, you know, and, and, and this sort of thing is like, I never would have even thought about that. I never thought about what was in my tampons. Yeah. Um, no, these neither. women are like, and then it turns out that it's like got formaldehyde in it, you know? And so, oh, so it's, um, it's, yeah, so it's like um, I, I think that there's a level of um, sort of savviness um, about and sort of an understanding, which you know I I, I think in some ways it's um, you know I, I think that that as a society and it, and and it might only be only like like certain segments of society because of course you know as somebody who's a college professor and a, and a researcher. Um, you know, I have definitely have a, um, you know, skewed worldview about like what people mm. are like, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm like educated, you know, mm-hmm. um, middle class, you know, blah, because that's mostly what um, what I'm around. But mm-hmm. I, I do think that, um, that there's an increasing uh, sort of understanding, at least in some uh, segments of society, you know, again, the ones I have access to, um, where... Uh, people understand that our body is this organism that has survived for millions of years without intervention from medicines and all, you know, all of these other things and like understand and like wanting to do things in a way that's more natural, sort of understanding the idea that our body is um, pretty well equipped to be able to deal with a lot of things and that we don't need to medicate everything out of existence Mm -hmm. and that we don't need Mm -hmm. to be putting all these artificial chemicals into our bodies yeah. um, and that like, wouldn't it be better to have us sort of doing things um, and consuming things that um, historically, you know, were nourishing to our bodies and that sort of thing. And I, so I think that there's a little bit of a, I think that there's a little bit of a culture, that sort of cultural change um, is also responsible for this. I have a question about uh, sexual practices these days, because I've heard that uh, in 
some parts of the world that people aren't having sexual intercourse as often mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, young people, that young people aren't. And so I'm wondering if that isn't making a difference. Women choose mates. Of, of all the animals, we choose our mates and we are picky choosers. Whereas like a chimpanzee or something, if they're ovulating, they'll have sex as many times as they can. They're not picky about that kind of thing, but we're picky. And so we go out of our way to choose a mate and we're choosing mates based on our hormones, our sex hormones in some ways. Like that's part of it. That's a big part of it. And, and we're fine. And so who men are because they're wanting to attract a woman is going to largely be influenced by what women are looking for in men. And so I imagine men are changing too. And that maybe this is a different conversation, but I'm very curious about how the birth control pill might be changing men's lives too, even though they're not taking the pill. Right. No, that's such an interesting question. And this is um, such an area of um, intrigue for me, uh, just because I've always been really interested in the way that small individual choices, like have these, you know, cascading mm. <laughs> consequences on, um, on society. And so, um, you know, one thing that we know about women um, is that our, like the pickiness that you're sort of referring to when it comes to partner choice is very much related to the consequences of sex. All right. So for example, if, um, you know, pregnancy is something that's possible because women are the ones who bear that really large cost associated with pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, women are incredibly choosy about their partners. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea being that not only is a woman picking somebody whose genes she's going to be intermingling with her own genes, mm -hmm. right. To like be her genetic legacy, so to speak, but also that she's, that she's choosing somebody who would potentially, who would help her raise an offspring, mm -hmm. right. Help, mm -hmm. help her raise a baby. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, human beings, uh, you know, we have these incredibly um, helpless, babies that are in need of so much care. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of research, um, you know, both in contemporary society, but even, you know, like, and especially in like, um, a hunter gatherer context. So they've done research looking at the survivability of children, mm -hmm. based on whether or not they have a father investing mm -hmm. in them, or whether mm -hmm. or not that is gone in a contemporary, like hunter gatherer group. And the survivorship of these children is incredibly low. Um, and it's because they, they oftentimes will get killed by other men. Yes. They'll um, not be protected. They won't get access to enough food resources. Right. Um, they're, they're, they get sick more frequently. It's just, it's, it's um, not good. And even in our contemporary environment where we have a lot of sort of safety nets to help women care for children in the absence of, of an investing father, mm -hmm. um, children still do less well. They tend to have more health problems. They tend to have more emotional problems. They tend to be more likely to end up in poverty. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And, uh, and so all of this is simply to say that when women are choosing somebody that they're going to be having sex with, if, if the pregnancy is something that is on the table as a possibility, um, women are really picky about both, like, does this person have the kinds of genes that I want to be p going on with my genes? Mm -hmm. And two, is this person going to be able to like provide and help and care and stick around and be mature and yes. raise a child? And, um, and so something interesting that happens with the birth control pill um, is you create a context in which uh, the probability of pregnancy from sex is almost zero, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and women know this, you know, and so um, women, their, their sexual decision making changes in response to this, mm -hmm. because now when they're choosing a partner, they don't necessarily need to choose somebody who's going to be a good dad and stick around and, and do all these other things. Mm -hmm.
Um, and so what we've seen in response to the pill on the women's side of things is we've seen that um, women are now having sex with a lot more partners than we used to, right? Mm -hmm. So we're having more sort of casual, and we're having more casual sex, mm -hmm. right? So casual sex with people that we don't necessarily think are, you know, going to be great providers and that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. so that's what we see happening on women's side. But then to get to your point, like, what does this mean then for men, right? Because one very powerful source of motivation for men in terms of achievement and, and everything else in, you know, in terms of being able to uh, make it in the world is that they want to get access to women. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can like this or not like this, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And you know, well, women favorite... and babies, families. Yeah, and mm -hmm. families. Yeah. To give them a feeling yeah. of providing and, you know, motivation to get out there and do the horrible things they have to do. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, but yeah, both of these things for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, one of my absolute favorite quotes of all time was one that came from Aristotle Onassis, who once said, you know, without women, all the power and money in the world would be meaningless. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that when you, you say that, and like to men, they just nod. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. They're like, Yep. And so, so, and, and, and the reason for this, of course, is that when you have those things, that's going to get you in a position where you get access to, to women, which is something that men are motivated to get. Yep. And so now when we have the pill and you have women that are having, are choosing men as sex partners, um, when they don't really have any sort of, um, you know, good dad kinds of qualities, they're not somebody who's going to be sticking around or not very ambitious, right? They're not working very hard some of these things that women used to have to prioritize when they were choosing to have sex with somebody because pregnancy was possible. Mm -hmm. Now you get men who are being chosen as partners, despite the fact that they're absolutely lacking in any type of quality that um, would, you know, be something that's associated with long-term provisioning. And, uh, and so um, one thing I speculate about in the book is that, is it possible that the pill by changing women's sexual decision making in the way that it has, which, which, by the way, um, is not to say that that's awful and that women shouldn't be able, because women should be able to do whatever how they want to, um, but th that this might, by virtue of the fact that women are now choosing men who don't really have any, you know, ambition or accomplishments of any sort, that this may be de incentivizing men to achieve anything. Yeah, I and wonder. we are right now societally, you know, in this like crisis in a lot of ways where we have, you know, men just are failing I yeah. mean, in ways that they, they're not that going they to haven't. university. Right? No, they're not. I mean, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not finishing high school at a greater rate than they used to. They're not going to university. They're not going on to get graduate degrees. Most graduate programs are now populated by mostly females. Yeah. Um, and men just, they, it's like, they've lost this, you know, source of motivation. And there's a lot of different factors that there contribute are. to this. Mm -hmm. There's video games and, you know, all yeah. these other things that sort of suck men in. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I would be, um, I would be willing to bet that the changes in motivational states by men, um, just in response to getting um, access to sex without having to have achieved anything um, is also a contributing factor. Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah, the, the the whole thing about, you know, young people not having sex anymore is really interesting and also tells you how societally, how... How fragile it is and how fragile yeah. it is. Like we're fragile. We think that we can, we think we can take things, you know, like hormones and be the master of our lives. But there are consequences to to these that are so far reaching we have no idea what we're messing with when we decide to take our biology into our own hands Whew. yeah <laughs> Whew. No, I completely agree it spooks me out that. yeah yeah no totally wow i could talk to you for a lot longer but that's all the time that we have thank you so much for writing this book and putting this information out there it's so necessary it's so important that all these young women take good care with what they put in their bodies and pay, and have the courage to share with their close friends and uh, people they can trust what's going on in their lives it's really important 
Yeah, no, for sure. I completely agree. So thank you. Thank you for having me. 